Today we have uh, our guest Michalis Yannaskis. He is an uh, emeritus professor from uh, King's College London and uh, honorary professor in uh, University College London. He is going to tell us about the Greece after the uh, after the uh, problems with the European Union and economy. Uh, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ismail. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Now, my talk is as somebody uh, commented earlier on is a hard uh, has a hard title: Greece, fiscal servitude, and the mirage of recovery. So. What I'm going to talk about in summary is what has happened in Greece mostly since 2015, since the election of Syriza to, to the government of Greece. And the government was elected and then by a referendum it was provided with a clear mandate to abolish the servitude of the country to the EU neoliberal policies. Nevertheless, here we are four years later and we're very much still in the same place. The standards, the living standards of the majority of the people are continually eroded. And at the same time, the mortgage has still been, uh, the wealth has still been mortgaged and not very much has changed. Nevertheless, there is a mirage of a recovery that's presented to the Greek people. But the status quo has not changed. It remains essentially the same. So I'll talk about the main events and factors that led to this situation and some prospects and lessons about the future. But uh, following Ismail's uh, introduction, I must make a clarification. What am I doing here? I'm a professor of engineering. My subject is turbulence. I don't teach economics or political economy. <laughs> so what's my motivation and background in this? Well, I'll explain a bit more in a minute. But I realized some time ago that the data series that I use in my research and the mathematical methods are exactly the same to the ones that I used in financial mathematics and in so-called financial engineering. And I realized that there's a lot of shenanigans that take place there. Luckily, I don't, didn't need to write a book about it. Some students of economics from the University of Manchester have done that. And in the end of the talk, I'll give you a list with some very useful books that if you want to have a look at. And the information I present is based on something like 150 articles I've written for Greek websites and, uh, and newspapers. So, let me just introduce you to some squiggles here to show you why what I'm doing is not dissimilar to what they do in financial engineering. What you see here is the data series that I deal with. This is velocity of turbulence. Turbulence, when we're in an airplane, it starts to go bumpy because the wind currents are not so steady. Well, so I've got series of data here. It looks nearly chaotic, fine, but with suitably advanced maths, we can analyze this thing. And if we need to make any assumptions, these assumptions are based on the laws of physics and they can be proven by experiment. So when we're doing any predictions with our data, we know how right or how wrong we are. And nowadays, we're much more right than wrong because of computers and so on. On the right-hand side, you see the variation of the stock market index, the FTSE 100, with time over a number of years. This data is not identical, but it's still chaotic. It has some trends and so on. And this is what is analyzed by the financial mathematicians and engineers using maths that are more or less the same as the ones we use in our field. The only difference is that the assumptions that they use are uncertain, they omit many real-world factors, and they can only be tested a posteriori, after an event. So you can predict what's going to happen in the future, but you're only going to know in the future, and if you're wrong, it's too late. So my talk will have four main parts. First, I'll talk about the haves, the rich, and the have-nots, the poor in Greece. And the hopes that were raised 
after the election of Syriza in 2015. Then, because we're talking about a sum, 350 uh, 50 billion uh, euros, that's the brick debt. We need to put it into perspective in global and EU context to see how important it is and why was all this fuss about it. I'll talk about austerity and what comes out of it, the rise of fascism and nationalism. And finally, talk about some prospects and what can we learn about the future. So, the prospects for the heavens in Greece, the, the wealthy ones. Let's start if a tourist is walking downtown uh, in Athens nowadays. They're going to look around and see the restaurants, the bars, the <coughs> cinemas, everything is full, people are spending money, so they're going to say, prices? What prices? Where is the prices? And this will be a totally misleading view of the situation, because what this tourist will not be able to see is all the people who are stuck at home, being unable to pay their heating bills, being unable to feed their families properly, and depending on handouts from social support structures and so on. There is a lot of these people, and these are not obvious, they're not seen. Uh, nevertheless, the Hebs have managed to send a lot of money abroad. There was an enormous outflow of capital, and remember, Greece is a small place. Only between 2010 and 15, 130 million billion uh, euros left the banks. Now, this, some of this money is under the mattress, is in safes, but a lot of it has been used for purposes like purchasing luxury flats in London. There is a, a tower, a residential tower in East London, which was sold about four years ago, it came out in the market, and the flats grow between two and four million pounds, and there's a large number of Greeks that have went there and bought the, these flats. Now, if you're one of the wealthy Greeks, really wealthy Greeks, like a ship owner, well, you can be sure. Constitution protects your income, and taxation is mostly voluntary. So you don't need to worry about your income going astray. What, is, what are these haves in Greece based on? Well, there's three pillars. First of all, black economy and tax evasion. Second is political clientelism and third, corruption. And corruption is so widespread that I put this quote by Professor Constantine Tukalas. It was back in the 1990s <laughs> in a talk in the LSE. The situation hasn't changed really. Non-participation in corrupt acti activities will be perceived as antisocial behavior. It's that widespread. And all this, these three pillars, are driven by the country's elites and they're almost guarantees to produce state indebtedness. The Greek crisis shouldn't have been a surprise for anyone. Now, what happens to the have-nots? Well, if we look at Greek GDP, gross uh, domestic product, it fell by 45% in seven years, from about $350 billion to $200 billion from 2008 to 2016 or so. What does this mean? Jobs became unavailable. Unemployment rose from 8 to 28%, and among young Greeks, it went up to 50%. Greek household disposable income dropped by 25% after 2008, and that's the a mean across the whole country. In many social strata, or the <coughs> poorer strata, the drop is much more substantial than that. <coughs> Now, this is a, a diagram from uh, Vasilis Fuskas and Bülent Grichai's recent book. And this shows you percentage change in unemployment rates over the years. So you can see unemployment rising. The, in red, the number of people at risk of poverty or social exclusion here. And that, again, is, you can see it rising, especially after 2000. Eight, nine. In terms of uh, self-reported needs for mental examination, which are unmet because it's too expensive, you see the green line here and how it's rising. And the last one is the, the actual, the adjusted disposable income per capita, which has been dropping steadily from 2008. 
So this is the situation for the have nots. So what does it mean? What does it mean in terms of employment? Well, if you have employment in Greece, for most Greeks, that means that you've got something like a 400 euro per month job, provided first you didn't get one, second that your employer pays you and pays you within a reasonable time scale. And sometimes people are not paid for months; it could be six months at times, and that you're not considered to be too old to be fully utilized, in other words, exploited. Why would you get a person who is over 35 or 40, who's worked in a decent job with a decent salary beforehand, when you can get a young person straight out of school and pay him a lot less and with lower expectations? <coughs> One other very important uh, uh, element that arose out of this is the housing problem. The red non-performing loans, NPLs as they're known, make up 45% of bank assets. That was in 2017. Now, red, most, a lot of these red loans are either credit cards or their housing loans, mortgages. So, the distress funds, distress funds are these voucher funds, basically. The opportunists who move in and buy very cheaply all these red loans at a small fraction of the value. <coughs> they don't want to live in Greece, they don't want to live in poor neighborhoods where people have their homes, so what happens is they try to sell them, and that results in auctions of people's homes. Because there was a, and there still is, a movement, demonstrations and so on against these auctions, now the government has found the answer. The auctions are done online, so you cannot have a pickets stopping people, uh, people's homes being, being sold. Now one can uh, <coughs> ask, well, isn't there any protection there? Doesn't the law protect these people? Well, yes, of course, there is law. But there is little or no protection that, that they offer. The system is very slow and extremely bureaucratic, the judicial system in Greece. You get very strange uh, results with sometimes very heavy sentences for minor offenses. And very light or suspended sentences for much heavier offenses. And you get, as we found out very recently in Greece, bribes of appeal court judges, where you don't need to pay the judge in your first trial because you're going to go to, to appeal. It's the appeal court the judge that you have to pay. Why pay two judges when you only need to pay the last one? So that's the, uh, the situation, and that all comes from the failures of Greek politicians and Greek capitalism. <clears throat> it's not unique to Greece, but what has happened very fast is the shifts to quick profits service sector at the expense of the productive sector, industry and agriculture. But this is made worse by the, by the state machine, which is rapacious, it's inefficient, and it serves political clientelism. So, Examples, jobs for votes. You vote for me, I'll find you a job in the, in the state sector. The, uh, we have the equivalent to the Turkish word, Rusvet, Rusvet in Greek. And this is basically what's built to what is called the favor bank. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, you support me, I'll support you in the future, and so on. So, this is very, very widespread. And at the same time, we have the politicians who connived and acquiesced to all the EU demands throughout many years. Greece was basically an ideal laboratory for EU political, social and financial developments. It was an excellent laboratory, small country, you can manipulate it easily, and that's what they did. But one of the worst <coughs> faults of the political establishment, the elites, was that they neutralized themselves, the parliament, because they agreed with all this bailout money that they got, they agreed to lose the best bargaining chip, which was to make laws in the country, in the uh, in parliament. They accepted governance by foreign laws. So a lot of these bailout agreements are subject to British law, for example, even though Britain is not in the Eurozone. Uh, so, they can't change the terms 
that are imposed on the country's finances because it's not under their control. So, what's uh, happened in 2015? In January 2015 was the election where Syriza, a uh, left-wing party, was elected with the slogan, Hope is coming. And what was very surprising at the time, and it's, it had, there was a very good feeling, is that you would go outside Parliament and you would get demonstrations for the government, actually urging the government to resist capitulation to EU demands. There were quite big demonstrations. It was quite a, a first in Greece that other people complained to the government, not try to support the government. So this was followed in uh, uh, July 2015 by the Greek referendum. And that was, the result was a 61% no to the EU terms. This is what the referendum was. Do you accept the EU terms or not? And that 61% has to be seen in relation to the project fear that went around it. Because there was a massive manipulation from the media, from the right wing and so on, that you Greece would leave the EU or the Eurozone. Now, first of all, leaving the EU was never intended. It was out of the uh, equation. And secondly, leaving the Eurozone is only possible by leaving the EU. This is, a lot of people find it very hard to believe, but there are answers from the, uh, uh, in the European Parliament, from the director of the European Central Bank, and from the EU Commission, but say no, no country can leave the Eurozone, they must leave EU. So all the threats that followed was, were basically empty threats. And that 61% would have been something like 67% if the Communist Party of Greece didn't make this four part. It basically said to all their supporters, vote for a different no. Now what does a different no mean? It means that you put something else in there, which is not, which is not the uh, contributes to the vote. Unfortunately, KKE proved ineffectual during the Great Crisis. A lot of the time, they stood to one side, put their line without actually trying to link with everybody else and make it some change. So, if there was that Brexit, which was the term for the Greece live in the Eurozone. It wasn't technically possible, but that was the term that was used at the time. That would have caused chaos and stability in the EU. But the Europeans knew. First of all, Greeks were not willing to leave the EU or the Eurozone. They just didn't like the terms. So, Greek. the Greeks. They didn't the answer is that, but Greeks. Greeks didn't want me to leave. That, that was there was no discussion about leaving, in general, the majority of the people, there was no discussion about leaving the, the, Eurozone, the, the EU. And Syriza performed, after the referendum, a political somersault. So this was the turnaround and accepted all the terms. And the result was this. Basically, EU was worried about the banks and the matters you fought to uh, enforce this fiscal servitude so that the banks didn't have to deal with the rental spending. So what we learned from this, that no to the EU terms without saying no to the EU proved ineffectual. And the red lines that Syriza had laid before the, its election were very short-lived. They said, we shall tear up the memoranda, the bailout agreements. They ended up signing a new one. No homes in the hands of bankers. Well, that was correct if they put comma for a while at least. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what was the EU priorities for, for the bailouts? The first and foremost was saving the banks. Now, the <coughs> European banks and banks around the world, we're talking about Europe here, they're, sub they're subjected to so-called stress tests, scenarios where they say, okay, if the market goes up or down, what would happen to that bank? Has it got enough money to, to last? Uh, these tests, the result of this test was highly optimistic. But if you listen to a number of us, uh, experts, they tell you they're worse than useless. Because it's a hypothetical scenario without knowing all the factors that go into it. 
So Greece got a lot of money, one may say, but now around 93% of the Greek bailout funds were used to pay back debt and to save German, primarily, French, secondarily, and Greek banks. A lot of this debt was in terms of the bonds that were given by the Greek state to support their banks, and this had to be paid back. So the money didn't go into Greece to help the economy, it just went straight back to the, straight back to the banks. And the European Union wanted to save the Eurozone. Well, there was, it was in the wake of the 2008 crisis, it was in, in quite a, a difficult situation. But again, it is important to note again that Greece was a small country, so it was a golden opportunity for the EU to set an example, adherence to, to fiscal rules. Remember that we have all the peaks countries, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece and Spain. Now Spain and uh, Italy are the big fish and that was there as an example. Look what needs to be done if you don't follow the rules. But it was also a golden opportunity for hedge funds and multinationals. When countries on its knees, <coughs> then these hedge funds move in and buy as much of the wealth of the country as they can and it knock down prices. And we can see some examples in a minute. So what was the methodology of the EU in order to save, in inverted commas, the British economy? Well, three parts. Fiscal austerity, deregulation, privatization. What they wanted to do, and they did, is this. Shift the private debt onto the public sector. This was done globally in the 2008, after the 2008 crisis. And we have to be thankful for this invention of this nice scheme to our own ex-Prime Minister, Gordon Brown. He was the one who turned up in a meeting and said, oh, well, is there a crisis? Fine, the, the state can pay for it. And brutal reforms were enforced, not just by the EU formal bodies, but by informal and accountable mechanisms, such as the Eurogroup and the Eurogroup Working Group. Now, these big bodies, do not have a constitution, do not have terms of reference. They are appointed by the ministers of finance between them, by the heads of state and so on. But nobody can find out if they've done something right or wrong. They don't answer to anyone. These were the people that were running the, the show. And another part of the methodology was to improve competitiveness, which invariably means abolish workers' rights, and abolish protection of wages and pensions. And finally, make sure that the EU is there to police the adherence to the fiscal rules. Now, there were different ways to save the banks. There is the bailout and the bail-in. The bailout favors capital. The bail-in favors the state and labor, basically, because it doesn't mean that you have to, to start uh, austerity in order to implement it. What is a bail-in? Bail-in is saving a bank through what's called a haircut, cutting down, taking money from the shareholders and the depositors. So basically if you've got money in the bank, a bail-in means that that money is taken away to cover the debt of the bank. A bailout is saving the bank through public funds, which means tax uh, rises, wage, pension, welfare cuts. But it's very, there's a very interesting example, which is not with Greece, it's in Cyprus, to see how the EU, together with the Cypriot government at the time, in 2013, connived in order to make sure that the bailing could still be shifted to favor capital, to favor the rich. Another example is the Cyprus, Cyprus Marfin Popular Bank, which collapsed at the time. So what does the Cypriot government and the EU do, they say, fine, well, we're going to have a haircut of all deposits in that bank. That included deposits under 100,000 euros that are guaranteed under EU rules. So the European Central Bank says, here's those deposits are guaranteed. And then the institutions of the EU with the Cypriot government agree to take money from all, all the people. What would this would have meant is that because there's a lot of people who have less than 100,000 euros, the wealthy people would save some of their money. 
because proportionately you could make it up from the poorer people. Uh, well, the Parliament of Cyprus realized, the MPs realized that there was no way they were going to be elected in ever again if they implemented something like this. So what they did is they forced the, uh, the government to honor the protection of these uh, 100,000 deposits. So the wealthier customers and the shareholders of the bank covered the entire cost. But you can see, even when you have an EU guarantee there, how it can be twisted around overnight. Now, why is there, was there such an intransigence of the EU towards Greece? Well, it wasn't just the EU, it was the EU hegemon. And the hegemony in Europe is that of the main creditor, Germany. So it was basically German industrial export capital in the EU, that's the one that calls the shots. They're going to pay most of the money to Greece and to all the other countries, so they call the shots. And there was a highly unstable market for some time. Remember 1992 and the run of the pounds? George Soros made two billion overnight. Uh, there was the dot com crisis in the early 2000s. Now, that, these were the, the babies. This was all worsened by, by the advent of derivatives. I'll explain in a minute what derivatives exactly are the financial products. And none other than that billionaire Warren Buffett has called them financial weapons of mass destruction. When the, if you don't know what they are, when I explain what they are, you'll see why. So the prime culprits for the German intransigence in 2015 in the negotiations with the Greek government was this. Deutsche Bank, the biggest German bank. I'm not saying it's the only culprits, but this was a major reason. In 2015, Deutsche Bank held derivatives worth $67 trillion. Just put all the zeros there so you can, you can understand the number. How much is $67 trillion? Is equal to the global GDP, everything that the world produces in a year. Or 20 times what Germany produces in a year. We're talking about this kind of money. This, if, if they went bust, that was an enormous risk for the German as well as the EU economy. And if you want to see how big the, the risk is, when the Lehman Brothers went down in 2008, they had less than half of this number, 31.5 trillion in derivatives and dodgy financial products. And globally, let's not just blame Germany, globally, the total value of derivatives is $630 trillion. This is according to the Bank of England data. Now, there's other estimates, and I'll talk about how they estimate them, or how they cannot estimate them later on. Other estimates put the derivatives from 1200 to $1,400 trillion. These are the sort of sums we're talking about. So let me just give you a very quick tutorial in derivatives. Okay, a derivative is a conference that derives its value from the performance of some entity. It can be a stock market index. It can be a, an interest rate or an asset. Now, when you own a derivative, it doesn't mean that you own the assets. All you're doing is you're saying basically, I bet that this particular asset would be worth that much after so much time. And for this reason, the only thing a derivative is, is good for is for speculating and hedging purposes. It's a speculative tool. So, if we look at the total wealth in the world in 2015, now wealth in inverted commas, as you'll see in a minute, here in this pie chart, this in gold is the amount of gold. In green is cash and deposits. In brown is estates, the buildings. So as far as this bit is concerned, one can say this is tangible wealth. It's money, it's gold, buildings, it's something I can use. Let's go to the rest of the wealth, because in blue we have the shares. Now shares can go up as well down in price. So how much is the value of shares depends on what day of the week you're looking at, uh, at in the stock market. Then you've got the international debt, which is here in black, and this is quite substantial. Now debts can only be considered as wealth if the person who owes you money can pay you back. If they can't pay you back, there's no money there. 
But the worst of it all, about two-thirds, is the derivatives. All this is the amount of what is global wealth, what you will see in the bank books and so on and so forth, that is due to the derivatives. And it's no exaggeration to say that it's a ticking bomb, basically, the derivatives. It can go off any time. Now, this was realized by a number of um, people in the banks, in the, in the markets, so they decided to improve the outlook by how else put in the books. The process that they use is called compression. What compression is, is shown in this diagram here. Let's say that A is a person or a bank, an institution, whatever. And A owes 15 million pounds to B. B owes 15 million pounds to C, C 15 million pounds to D, and D 15, 20 million pounds to A. So there's four different bits there. And what they do in the compression, they say, well, we can forget about everything else, we can sum everything up, so in effect, D owes to A 5 million pounds. So the risk, which is 65 million altogether, is present as 93% low. Now, there is, using tricks like that, the global value of derivatives was reduced to 542 trillion within two years. So it's basically 100 trillion down already. Now, this is, there is an inherent assumption there, which is the same as what caused the problem in 2008. Those were, at the time, was the problem was primarily with the credit default swaps. What are these? Okay, let's say that uh, 10 banks have got a uh, debt of some person or of a company of £100 each. So the same fine, well, if that company or that person grows bust, I lose £100. The way to, to deal with this is we take each one of these hundred pound debts and we cut it into ten. So I give you ten pounds each of the, my debt. You give me ten pounds of your debt and so on and so forth. So we still all have debts of a hundred pounds but that is made of ten bits of ten pound debts. So if A grows bust, it's not going to, B is not going to grow bust at the same time and C and so on. So we're safe in this way. Well, it sounds logical. but. When people grow bust, when companies grow bust, they grow bust for a reason, because the economy is not doing well. In 2008, everybody lost their job suddenly, everybody couldn't pay their mortgages, so all these debts went red, and the system collapsed. Compression assumes something similar. Not quite the same, but it's something similar, because they saying, well, everybody else is going to be able to pay everybody uh, in this chain, so basically that's the only thing we need to, we can replace all this with that. But it doesn't mean that at any time any of these people have got the money in their hands to, to close the loop. Now, so what is the great debt in the global context? I gave you some enormous numbers earlier on, and we know that 0.7% of the population of the globe owns 50% of the wealth, only a few weeks ago, watch from told us that 26 billionaires have as many assets as 50% of the people in the world. But the point is that these people, they call the shots and they run the World Bank and the IMF and so on and so forth. And they are mocking the poor. I mean, at the same time, the World Bank tells us that the, globally the number of people in extreme poverty, now extreme poverty means living for less than 1.9 dollars per day. And that number is unacceptably high to <coughs> drop. I'm emphasizing this because I've been to a number of presentations where they were flashing this, these numbers up and diagrams and saying, look, poverty is really dropping across the world. Now you try and live on 1.1 dollar per day, even if you're in Indonesia or in the middle of Africa or wherever. It's impossible. But the icing on the cake is not just the mockery, the fact that there, is a, there has been a billionaire theft plan to suppress democracy. It's been going on for some time. And this was driven by James McGill Buchanan, who is a Nobel laureate, a Pinochet advisor. 
He died uh, a few years ago. And he formulated the so-called public choice theory, which can only be outlined such. The rich should not pay taxes. That was his theory. Basically, you, you must let them make wealth, and if they make wealth, everybody else will benefit. Now, uh, there is a book that I have in the further information at the end, because this information came out because a, a distant, honest professor, Nancy McLean, I think her name is, uh, she went to his house when he died in the university campuses and found his archives and found out that this guy was involved in an enormous conspiracy worldwide where they were hidden from all sides trying to take state and people's money in order to help the billionaires. And if you think that uh, nobody is big enough to make a big difference, the Paris Chalant, Paris Chalant for example, is BlackRock. BlackRock is a shadowy superpower, is a financial institution of sorts. It has $5.1 trillion at its disposal. But not only that, because its software runs a number of systems and a lot of other organizations depend on it, it actually influences investments of $15 trillion worldwide. Now, nowadays, the, um, or at the time that I was looking up these numbers, the uh, global GDP was about $6 trillion. So this is, you work it out, what percentage of the GDP, the global GDP, this involves. So, after all this, the Greek debt, in comparison, it was 350 billion euros. It was a lot of money. But you need to take it all into this context. It was half a percent of the Deutsche Bank derivatives bubble, and about under 2% of the European Union GDP. Greece would not have, uh, the Greek debts would not have caused a collapse in the system. It was basically allowing somebody to get scot free that would cause the problem in the system. So the EU approach was treat the headache. We must treat the headache, which is the Greek debt, and allow the cancer, which is the market bubble, to fester. And that's what they did. How did they do it? Well, by what I call mathematical alchemy. <laughs> alchemy of the technocrats. And these technocrats are selectively trained. Many of the economic theories are not taught at universities. There is a very good book that I'm giving at the end uh, in the <coughs> references that was written by three uh, economic students of the University of Manchester. And it's it really, you don't need too many to understand economics very much to, to read it, but it's, it's worth going through it because it really tells what shenanigans are involved in there. Uh, so, the predictions, the financial predictions, are tuned to, tuned to get the desirable answers. So, in effect, is exactly the opposite of what, what a scientist would do to, for me, it would be a, 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 an eternal sin you know, put in theory before the facts. The models do not incorporate many important factors, partly because they don't know how to incorporate them, real world factors. And I'll give you an example. Let's say that you want to predict what the uh, wheat price is going to be 12 or 18 months from now. Well, how would you know what the weather is going to be like in 12 or 18 months? So you don't know what the harvest is going to be. So it's a total guesswork. It's just a bet. And why is all this thing done? Well, as the saying goes, whoever pays the piper calls the tune. In this case, whoever pays the economist calls his expert opinion. And one tool that is used is this financial engineering. You can get many definitions of financial engineering, but I think the most succinct and to the point would be profit maximization, primarily via explosion of derivative trade. That's what they're trying to do. Why, why try to invest in something that may give you back a small percentage, it may be 50 or 100 percent of what you put in, but you can generate it artificially through the trade in these derivatives. It's all basically a non-existent money. And an ironical coincidence to finish with this part is that in financial mathematics, the sensitivity of 
that the value of derivatives is assessed by what's known as the Greeks, <laughs> which happen to be parameters that are, have, uh, are characterized by Greek letters. So, this is what I've said so far, you have to take me on trust. But here is the belated admissions of the truth. First of all, from the Bank for International Settlements, it tells us that every set of statistical data on derivatives has been designed for a specific analytical use. Such data cannot be easily combined. What this basically says, we just don't have any idea how big the derivative bubble is. Then, in the Greek issue, uh, Harun Dysoblum, the Dutch finance minister, was the chair of the Eurogroup in 2015, the one who led the assault to, to, uh, towards Greece. He was interviewed by Spiegel, the Spiegel, in 2018. And what he said, he admitted the threat to the Eurozone of the possibility of a Greek exit, whatever that action could entail. The Eurozone would simply be cares for your imagination if we allow the country more to leave the whole Eurozone would be more fragile. So, first, he told the Greeks, you have to do this, there's no other way. Now, he tells us the real reason why he said this. Uh, also, uh, one of the other institutions that was involved in that Greek crisis was the IMF. And in last October, it decided to rub some salt to the wounds. IMF was insisting on austerity and privatizations. And in the IMF fiscal monitor, it tells us that privatizations are a fiscal illusion that can harm the country's economy. So, you take their advice. Now, what is the what, what sort of privatizations and what was the raison d'etre, the reason why the, the uh, privatizations were pushed to Greece? Let me start with a question mark. There was a curious fixation which still persists today about VAT rates in the Greek islands, in the Aegean. Now, what, with particular pressure from the Germans, they wanted to change the VAT rate in the Greek islands, because that VAT rate is kept artificially low. The reason is that the islands need transports to get energy, water, food, anything. So there's an additional cost there. There's small communities that don't have the economies of scale of the mainland. So, the VAT rate is about 10% lower than it is in the mainland, thereabouts. Nobody quite understood why the Germans were pressing so much, and we still don't know the reason. But there is a, uh, we suspect that there may be German interests in some of the big uh, hotels along the Turkish coast. They're not, they may be Turkish owned, but there's German interests in there. We don't know. But anybody who has any information, I would welcome it, because that's still a question mark to me, and I haven't read anything that anybody has come to, to the bottom of that. The other one was the uh, drug markets. Now, Greece doesn't have anything other than a generic drug market. There's no trademark drugs made in Greece. And what the EU requested is that generic drug prices in Greece must be kept low. Uh, one would say, isn't this a good thing? Low drug prices? Well, yes, it looks very good, so nobody can have an immediate uh, argument for this. But this pharmaceutical industry, the Greek one, which was dependent on these drugs, goes bust, is in tatters already. And God knows how many of them are going to survive, because the prices have uh, dropped quite substantially. Secondly, Greece is useful as a price setter. The way that they set the generic drug prices in, uh, in Europe is they take values from three countries. So it helps to have a low one in order to drop the, drug the generic drug price if you like. Now, it's good to have cheap drugs, but the, these drugs were not going to be replaced by the Greek generic drugs, by cheap other generic drugs. The first thing is the industry would collapse, so the companies would move in, the big pharmaceutical companies, and they would flood them, flood the market with trademark expensive drugs. And then, if you have somebody, let's say, this is my scenario, like an Indian generic drug firm wanting to bring drugs in, 
then they would, it would have to go through all the loops and hoops of Europe in order to be able to send its, its branch to Greece. So it's a complicated issue, but there was a reason why they pushed for something like this. Another one is the brick airports. There were hundreds, many of them were handed lock, stock and barrel to the German co company Fraports. It's ridiculously low prices. There's many more examples, and now there's even a list of archaeological sites. I think it's 200 uh, archaeological sites up for sale. Two private companies to use as they like. And all these things, the unemployment and all that, all this austerity, unsurprisingly, it bred fascism in the country. And it's not only in Greece, it's worldwide. <coughs> and we have to thank for it all these stateless, uh, stateless elites that move their manufacturing from one country to the next according to where there's the lowest labor costs and they're promoting this fake patriotism. And we even have the press talking all the time about populism, but right with populism is populism, if you look it up in the dictionary, there's different definitions. Today's populism, as defined by the press, is something totally different. The right wing populism it's just a misnomer for creeping racism and fascism. It's not the populism as we understood it 20 or 30 years ago. In Greece, that was uh, that meant the advent of the neo-Nazi golden dog. Now, if anybody has any doubt about the Nazi uh, nature of golden dog, one has to look. This is the cover from one of the magazines from some time ago. That says golden dog in in Greece in Greek. And we can only see who their idol is here. I mean, this is, these are the people that were voted by something like 8% of, of the Greeks and have got 20 MPs in Parliament to, to still today. And they may be taking a populist stance, but the scapegoat and the migrants, while they turn the blind eye to the bankers and the ship owners. Uh, most of the, the, the MPs and the leadership and many of the members have been put to trial for having a criminal organization. <coughs> They've already killed two people so far, They've, but officially we know of. They've beaten a lot of people. They've caused so much uh, uh, trouble and hardship to a number of people. There's piles of evidence points, pointing to a criminal organization. Nevertheless, the trial started in April 2015 but almost four years later, the trial is still ongoing. There's plethora of videos with Nazi salutes, symbols, anthems, and the like. So when the Nazi party became very apparent, the defense changed up. In the beginning, they said, no, we're not Nazis. And we said, well, perhaps we are. That's freedom of speech. So, and we hope that the trial is going to come to an end within this year. But we also have another issue which helped nationalism rise, and that's the Macedonian issue. Now, for the record, 60 years ago, in 1959, the Greek government recognized the Socialist Republic of Macedonia, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. It's in the government gazettes. You can see it in black and white. If you don't read Greek, well, this government has said this law is passed in both uh, 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 French translation and Greek translation. The French translation is first as well. Because they, they decided that they were going to do it when they were signing various treaties. So despite that, in 1990s, various opportunistic politicians stirred up uh, inflamed uh, nationalistic feelings for their own political gain. That died down and in 2010, especially, 10, especially in the last three years or so, the same people, the culprits of that crisis in the 1990s, start playing the nationalistic card again. And they're helped to quite an extent by the mass media propaganda. There's a, there was a hysteria. The church, <coughs> the nationalists, all started arguing that there's only one Macedonia, so it's ours, that's it. And an example. Well, there were some large demonstrations, nationalistic demonstrations in Athens, in Thessaloniki, and so on. 
the one in Athens was supposed to be the big one. And if you read the press and listen to the organizers, there were 1.5 million people there. Well, 1.5 million is, Athens is at the very best 3, 4 million if you take all the suburbs. So half of Athens was supposed to be down there. Well, 1.35 million of them were invisible. Because if you look at the area where the demonstration was covered by the demonstrators, you can calculate quite easily how many people can fit in there. It's about 150,000. But this helps build the argument that, look, everybody's against this issue. So everybody's nationalist, everybody's, everybody's a staunch patriot, and so on. And of course, this issue gives a resurrection, which is a springboard for the fascists to rise again. Now, where has it led Greece? What prospects are there for growth? Greece has hydrocarbons in the Aegean and Adriatic seas, and this is what presented. This is where Greece is going to make its money from, like Cyprus, from the <coughs> hydrocarbons in the, uh, in the Mediterranean. But what is not known is that these deals are dealt with by an energy, the energy charter. Very few people know about it. And this energy charter is there's a, started as European, now it's a global one. And this is basically organizing this ISDS schemes. This is Investor State Dispute Settlement Schemes. What does this mean? If Company A goes to Greece and says, OK, fine, I'm going to drill there for oil and natural gas. I'm going to invest so many millions in equipment. I'm going to invest so, invest so much in my power, and I expect future profits to be X. If Greece or any other state says at some stage, well, you can't do it, you're damaging the environment, you, you really, everybody's against it and all that, they have to pay these people for even loss of future profits. And so far, states, not Greece, but various states around the world have paid 52 billion to investors for loss of profit or opportunity. So that's number one. And even if, let's say, everything goes smooth, there is a carbon bubble. The scientists in very re uh, reputable journals that have been warning for a very long time, energy use is going down. People realize that energy is expensive. It's bad for the environment to, to use too much energy. There's all these renewables. So they estimate that by 2050 or 60, I'm not going to remember exactly, energy needs will have dropped by something like 40 percent, a very substantial amount. So a, will, a lot of it will be taken over by the uh, renewables like wind energy, tidal energy and uh, solar energy. So all this can be a very big bubble basically that will produce very little for Greece because Greece is not going to see any money for 20 or 30 years over that. The other one is the renewables bubble and the green growth. Well, there are renewables like uh, solar energy and wind energy, but EU is based around the renewable biomass, which is basically woods, palm oil, and stuff like that. This is not renewable. You chop a tree down, and then you have to wait for it for so many years to grow up again. Or you take all the palm oil out of Indonesia, and not only have you destroyed the jungle in order to grow the, produce the palm oil, but you have to wait to make more and more palm oil. And there's nothing renewable in that, apart from one thing, the subsidy. Because EU and the states are providing very generous subsidies. The subsidies go low for this renewable biomass. And what happens is, well, you, if you know about the photovoltaic systems here, where everybody was given subsidies to install photovoltaic systems in your roof and all that. And then suddenly, suddenly this subsidies collapsed. Well, with this renewable, with this biomass fuels, the subsidies are still standing there because it's a relatively new thing. But as soon as they draw them out, and they will draw them out before long, then the small companies that are set up to exploit the subsidies collapse, and big interests come in and take over. And that's basically where this is headed. But one good thing in Greece, we're told nowadays, is tourism. is really growing very fast. That's true. So are the Airbnb lets 
in places like Athens and in many tourist destinations. And what happens? The rents become unaffordable for the locals. And since homelessness and evictions rise so sharply, you can imagine what these people are faced with. And tourism is growing very, very fast in Greece, really fast in the last couple of years. The point is how much of the money is staying there. Because tour operators moving gets a number of hotels and say, fine, you know, you're going to give me a room for, uh, for my customer for 200 pounds a week or whatever and I'll take X back, and that never stays in the country to be invested or, or used for other purposes. So, it's been a mockery all, all along, and it's a mockery that we should have known from the very beginning, on anybody who bothered to look, because there were leaks from EU institutions on 1st of July 2015, major European papers, that even if growth of 4%, now, 4% growth is, is enormous. Uh, even with growth of 4%, <coughs> the Greek debt would not be sustainable by 2035. But we get, again, the IMF providing a mirage. In that IMF monitor that I mentioned earlier, you get a list of about 40 data, about 40 states. Greece is among them. In terms of budget surplus, Greece is at the top. In terms of strength of the economy, Greece is at the bottom. Now you go figure how the state with the weakest economy is managing to have a record budget surplus. And also, at this particular period, it's a pre-election period in Greece, so we see government generosity. It's don't expect much money, but you know, they're giving out some money of the order of 200 euros or so per household, once off generally in order to <coughs> sweeten the, the pill after the so many years of austerity. So, they, we have the end of austerity officially in Greece, which is again invisible. We don't have the memoranda, but austerity is earmarked for many years to, to come. And we have to comply with fiscal targets. This is a sine qua non. And what have we done with the debts? The Greek debt to GDP ratio has worsened. It was 110% in 2008, it was 108% in 2017. After the austerity, privatizations and everything, the privations, it's grown up by that much. So what's the horizon like now? Well, there's going to be elections by September or very latest October, middle of October 2019. Uh, it's difficult to tell how many parties are going to be there because MPs keep constantly keep on uh, moving parties. Perhaps the, the recent movements here in the, in the UK, have, they've used a great example there. So you don't know a lot of the centre uh, party MPs, you don't know which party they're going to be from one week to the next. The Conservatives, the New Democracy Party, they have a clear lead in the polls, but probably not enough to form a government, a majority government. So they're making overt overtures to the far right and covert ones to the neo Nazis. Syriza, the government party, is about anywhere from 5 to 10 percentage points below the Conservatives, so he's making overtures to the center and the center right. And these overtures are really big. They are appointing ministers, ex MPs, or people from those parties to the government. The left is fragmented. There are no alliances that are emerging at present that may, may have a chance of getting um, representation in the next Greek parliament. It's highly unlikely. The KKE, the Communist Party of Greece, is the only one that's likely to be in the next parliament with a percentage of something like 6, 7%, something like that. And the Nazi Golden Dome, well, they keep on having a steady support, which is about between 6 and 8%. And depending on what happens in the trial, if it finishes quickly, they may end up being in the next parliament and they're making already overtures, quite open ones, to the new democracy for collaboration. So, what happens? 
while the struggle was undermined by the petitions. And there was a, well, everybody believed in Greece that it was quite a golden opportunity in 2015. Um, you got people from many parties of the left joining together in support in Syriza. But people delivered, the government faltered. People depended on leaders and intermediaries. Without program. It wasn't just a question of perhaps they had a program, but it wasn't a program that they, they called out to that they uh, were going to follow. Leaders and intermediaries proved ineffectual. Once again, it's not the first time, of course. And one of the things I hope many of my compatriots have learned is that moving without social movements, not having social movements that will ensure adherence to pre electoral commitments, is a lost cause. You're not going to do anything. The politicians are going to change tack. The other problem that is faced the fragmentation of the great trade unions along party political lines. And I don't just mean right and left. You can have some trade unions where they will get together and they're going to try to again do clientelism, even within the working class. They're, they're not effective. There are strikes, there's many one day strikes, and people often wonder why do they have this one day strike? What are they going to achieve? A great example, unfortunately, shows exactly what the left must avoid doing at all costs. And there are signs that something could happen because the system is becoming much more unstable. There's trouble at the top as well as at the bottom. The structural problems of capitalism have intensified, especially since 2008. The fault lines in the global power structures are shifting, intensifying, and the elites are destabilized and disoriented almost as much as everybody else. I mean, you can see what's happening today. The globalization project is currently having a very bumpy ride. But what can be done in what has been done in Greece? Well, there is a rekindling of the struggle but nothing in comparison to what was happening from 2012 to mid-2015. There were massive mobilizations, demonstrations, and so on. After the referendum, there's been a hiatus after the capitulation. People were very disappointed, and they, uh, there was not the, the, the emphasis that was there before the uh, referendum. We do have new social movements that rekindle the struggle, but these are mostly in terms of social solidarity structures. Uh, pharmacies, social pharmacies, clinics, kitchens, food banks, the movement that I mentioned just the auction and the repossession of the uh, homes, and many refugee solidarity support, support structures. Not enough, not as many as there should be, but there is quite a start. And there is an effort to fight the corporate media misinformation, disinformation rather, onslaught through independent news media, journalism and documentary making. So things are happening, but it, there is a hiatus right now, and it looks like it's going to take some time for the struggle to be built up again, in Greece at least. So let me just finish by telling you about the further information I promised. The first one, the book about Black Rock, is in German, but there is an article in New York Times that uh, describes the book uh, quite, uh, quite well. The book by Davis is about the elites, primarily British elites, but it applies to the European elites as well. This is the book by the three uh, now ex-economic students of Manchester University about the college technocracy. It's basically the shenanigans that are done in the financial field. The book by Vasilis uh, and uh, Willem uh, Jekai is about the um, fault lines in the global power systems and how they're changing right now. Uh, I would not never recommend a publication of the IMF as uh, bedtime reading, but it's, it's useful to just have a look at it. It's a very big booklet, about 100 pages, but it tells you how 
the, the speech is really double speech. I mean, the speech about one thing and then the speech about the opposite. The book by Prostas uh, Lapovitsis is about the left case against the EU and has a lot of useful data. It's very readable and relatively short. And if you do find the energy, I recommend this book by Nancy McLean. This is about the uh, billionaire plan, the stealth plan to suppress democracy that I mentioned earlier on. Okay, so I'll stop here and I'm happy to answer any questions. We have 45 minutes for discussions, so let's not give a break. Let's just, if you want tea or coffee, you can just serve yourself. Let us start discussions. We said that the Greek crisis should not have been a surprise to anyone. Greek went through how many times to default? Uh, if you look Since back... 18, 18 something. 1830, you mean, yeah. something like that. Oh, many times. At least we gave the up and down in the graphic yeah. turbulences. Yeah. <laughs> that means Greek have gone four or five times with that turbulences. Yeah. And they could have created a solution, as you said, between 2012 to 2015. Lots of social mobilization. And Shriza created during that uh, time. Yeah. And Shriza or other left, including KKE, did not produ produce any program to come out that structure. No. That's and they did not analyze the, that physical stuff. <laughs> and they did not come conclusion to, for instance, coming out from the EU, or not only EU zone, but EU. How can be anyone blind in the Greek, Greek, uh, Greek society, especially from the left, including the KKE, to not to see the fact? No, the KKE is against the EU. KKE is against the EU. But KKE is, is taking a, a very peculiar, unique approach to things. That if, if some other parties or people uh, formulates a constructive solution to something. I'm not talking about the whole crisis because that's a very big issue. But if they provide a constructive solution, KKE will not accept it if it's not from within them. Yes, exactly. It's this is where the rather arteriosclerotic about it. So, and what you mentioned about the previous crisis, uh, no two crises are are similar because right mm -hmm. now. We are, we've gone past the uh, uh, Bretton Woods Agreement, we've gone into the globalization. So, what happened, for example, the, the, the bankruptcy of the 1880 in Greece, the bankruptcy of the 1930s, were quite different kettle of fish to the, the one today. But nobody came out with any proposal. The series of proposals, in the beginning at least, was to let Varoufakis go forwards and say, look, it's, it's in your interest to give us money and not ask us to pay back too quickly. Still stay in EU and Eurozone. More uh, yes. prescription was that. Yeah. Yeah. But your solution was coming out from the EU and Eurozone. This, this is the only way it can be. That was the only way. I mean, uh, we discussed that earlier, 2012, 2013, yeah. with other people. You should have come out from the EU. Simply like 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 like, like 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 British are doing now. I don't think I'm going to be devil's advocate here. I don't think it would be so easy to say uh, come out of uh, EU and everything is going to honky dory. It won't be no, it because won't be because the country is already bankrupt. There is nothing in the economy is working and people's salary I remember gone down so dramatically they can't even buy a kilo of whatever they they are requiring. So in a way there wasn't any organized working class movement. Basically, as far as I can remember at that time, there was only one solution which is going absolute uh, revolutionary 
socialist democracy in order to get out of that mess. So in a way, Syriza, I may be wrong, uh, trying to find a midway between how am I going to rescue the economy as well as staying within the uh, European <coughs> zone. So I think from all of it, what I wanted to know is that what was the experience of the working class? What did they come out of from all these you know, turmoil Greece went through? What was the benefit for the working class, if there is any? I think people, I, I can't talk for the working class. I can talk generally about the people that I've talked to in Greece. And people are very confused. You would get, I've got people telling me that they voted for Syriza one day, and next time they voted for Golden Dawn. I mean, it's that much of a confusion. A lot of people who supported Syriza <coughs> were not necessarily left, but they had the image of the previous socialist party in, back in the PASOK, back in the 1980s and so on. So they saw Syriza as being the new socialist party, PASOK, of the old days. It, is a, it wasn't a clear situation. The problem was that Syriza could not, in reality, could not have a problem, could not do very much, because they didn't have people. They didn't have the, the manpower, the, uh, the cadres there, in order to, to fulfill the posts. Even today, I mean, I've, I've been told by a number of uh, acquaintances that they're offering places to anybody who's got any expertise and will think, they think that it's vaguely on their side, because they can't fill the posts. It's, there, there was no plan, there was no real program it happened far too quickly. A party of 2% went to 4%, went to 15% and went to government. Yeah. All in the space of a few years. And there was nothing, nothing uh, holistic, no, no <coughs> movement underneath to drive that party. Well, some time ago, there was a unite meeting where three Syriza ladies were invited. You were there, yeah. I was there as well. Those ladies uh, were talking about people organizing themselves in communes or whatever. Now, what is the real situation other than they were series of people, they were making party propaganda, actually, yeah. not very nicely, but uh, what is this actual situation now? How did the laboring people of Greece tackle the situation in a positive way. <coughs> the situation is horrible. I understand that. But there can be some positives like organization, self-organization out of all this. How did they do it? Well, when those ladies fall into these solidarity structures that I mentioned about, so they are trying to organize something. They are doing some good work. I mean, it's not everything that's related to, to to series of supporters, if not bad. They are doing uh, quite good work there. But the issue is that they will not, they, they cannot open up, they've cut their uh, links with the left, anything that's left of series. Huh? So now they're opening towards the center and center that's right. right. So it's going in that direction. You, the, you need to understand that uh, a reasonable proportion of the Greek working class, the industrial man manufacturing working class, were and are supporters of KKE. And KKE has its own share of the burden because they are not really given proper leadership or guidance. It, in my opinion, the more try to keep themselves as you know their patch protected rather than opening out and saying, okay, now we need to work with others. I cannot explain it anymore. Uh, my question is, um, it affects people like you as well, is there an alternative model that's being developed by the, by the socialists, by the intelligentsia, that can show the way forward? Because you said that people are against coming out of the EU, that's a very natural reaction. If there's no alternative, where are they going? The small economy and the FAP express the situation is 
In the 60s, 70s, people in Latin America were building models of how, how they could break away. And uh, in the Middle East, there's all kinds of models that have been tried, nationalization and uh, state-injected uh, state, uh, uh, development. But is there such a debate in, in, in Greece at all? I mean, for small, small countries, there a way out? There is no debate that I know of. And the, the difference with Latin America that you mentioned is that there is the noose of the EU right now there. So basically everything is did. The, the, the country, the parliament, cannot take decisions for itself. For the next 10 or 15, 20 years, it's controlled by these restrictions of the bailouts, of all the loans it has. So it won't be able to, to do anything. As far as the intelligence is concerned, well, a lot of it has left the country. Mm. True. And so I think the, um, as far as I know, there are more doctors, Greek doctors in London than in Greece. Well, so which is I may be an exaggeration, but there's a lot of Quite a lot of people, you know, came out of the country because of that chaos. Um, However, I want to know before, obviously during 19, 15, 2015, uh, they were talking about quite a lot of, as you mentioned, quite a lot of corruption, mismanagement, and wrong investment, especially according to BBC, it may not be correct, there are more Greek shipping industry is registered in Panama then in Greece. Yes. So when you have this type of practice, obviously, country bound to be uh, bankrupt. Is there anything changed? Is it still the no. same? No, the, uh, there is a revision of uh, the constitution that went through, uh, is going through now. I'm not sure whether it's voted or it's going to be voted one of these days. Uh, sorry, I think it has been voted last week. And the article that has to do with the ship owners is exactly the same. The, there is no indication without, if, if, if there isn't social movement, somebody to push, politicians will not react. I mean, they will just keep on doing whatever they do. How much of the corruption and all that, how much it has changed quantitatively or qualitatively, we won't know for some time yet. Because all these scandals come out in the, with the passing of time. So if something is going on now, we won't know for some time. But we're finding out the, the scandals of the previous two, three de decades. We're talking about very big scandals, you know, ministers, uh, and millions of money. I mean, it can't be worse than Turkey, so... Turkey is a bigger brother, we so all that. One thing amazing, I, I lived a, a little bit in Greece and North Island. Three months, I observed the people, people behaviors. It was after the election. Uh, there were some stick to issues. Then uh, things start to be changing. Uh, every month, 10 euro less money was coming to the workers, retired people, this and that. But what I realized, Social problems were really there, you could see. Hospitals were not working properly. Uh, if you go to the tax office, tax office wasn't working properly. If you go to uh, DVLA equivalent there, it wasn't working properly. You could see uh, hundreds of workers there, none of them are working properly. You could see that. You don't need to learn the language. I know the behalf of bureaucracy uh, rubbish in Turkey it was exactly the same, maybe worse or same. Same stuff. Then I turned to Shirza uh, guides. I said, why don't you take over? Why don't you, I mean, why don't you, you created the party, you managed to create the party, you didn't create the party in one night, you created the party between 2012 to 2015. Actually, it, it would go back to 2008, even. They sought to create the party or party structure, something like that, in the local areas, neighborhoods. They create sort of commune life there. Then they create the party. 
I, I asked them, why don't you create a community rule this department or hospital system or solidarity system or refugee uh, support system? There was no answer. Why they were in the government? While they were in the No, they were in the government, that's why they didn't find any other solution. They were creative in 2008, 2009, 2011, 2012, 13, 14, but they weren't any more creative in 2015, 2000. That it goes back to what we said earlier on. I mean, there's a tiny party, a tiny left wing party, suddenly becomes the government in a state of a few years. There is no time to build the structures. It, no time it, it, now, I'm not talking about the, the party anymore. I'm talking about the people. I'm talking about the people in the social movement, in the neighborhood, in the factory floors, in, uh, in the agriculture, wherever they are. They're, whoever they built that party, they were belong to a neighborhood, they were belong to the factory, they were belong to some, some, some places. Why they are not, they, they were not anymore active in that areas, in, and uh, why didn't they push the government? Well, there's, there's very few examples that I know of anyway, because uh, I haven't lived there for continuously for, for 50 years. Mm. Uh, there's very few areas that you can see the local mayor organizing the, 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 the place very well and pushing the government for developments. There are, there are examples, but they're very few. Why is a very long uh, question, mm. and it requires a very long answer. Well, my question is this. Uh, what happened to agriculture? Are the Greeks growing their own vegetables and fruits, which is enough for the society, or are they importing it? If they are importing it, how come they are importing it? If they are not importing it, how come they are not organizing themselves into more cooperative fashion than uh, before? Uh, well, or is it too small? I don't know. It's the, there is some agricultural increase. A lot of the labor is now migrant labor, which is treated extremely badly. I mean, we have many cases where migrants were beaten up, shot, and so on. Um, and it's. It, a lot of the, the Greeks simply do not want to do this job. It's a hard job, and they don't want to do it. So you you depend on somebody who's prepared to have a um, to cultivate pro product X, whatever it may be. Um, there are some very good examples. I mean, I was surprised listening to what happens in uh, Crete, for example. They grow different grapes of different sizes because they know the Germans like it this big, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> rich like it this big, and so on. And they they manage to to produce all this all this stuff all over the place. But even in the stuff with, where Greece is, should be leading the uh, the field, olive oil. Olive oil is produced a hell of a lot of olive oil is produced. A lot of it goes to Italy to be bottled and sold as Italian product. Well, it may say somewhere, you know grown in wheat. It's, it's quite a lot of it. Which they lose lots of money. Yes. When they sell it in bulk. It is, I mean, that, that is a question that it's far simpler to answer, but still doesn't have an answer. They, they, there is high quality of olive oil that's been sold, which is rather expensive. But the type of everyday stuff that you want to put in your salad, should all be exported from Greece and they send it to Italy. They can't be bothered, it's the risk or whatever. And why can't they find their workers, you said, in the farms? Because something similar is happening in Turkey as well. You know, it's, it's very difficult to find workers. In fact, we went to Fatma's village in the east and the shepherd was an Ukra Ukrainian. <laughs> they couldn't find shepherds, you know, they couldn't pay money to shepherds, and that's in, the, in a very small village in East Turkey. So you got either Ukrainians working, or uh, we even came across a, a Lithuanian working in the farm. So why do you think this, is that a problem generally? There's one word. Sorry? One word. Yes. Urbanization. Mm. Yeah. I, I, was, I was born, I was, sorry, I grew up most of my uh, 
youthful uh, years, I spent practically five minutes walk from the edge of the city. And now to walk from there to the edge of the city, it will take you hours. We're talking about a country of something like 10 million, 11 million right now, with somewhere between four and five million in the greater area around Athens. And if you look at all the, the, the bigger cities, five or six, take five or six bigger cities, it's well over half. I mean, I'm, I don't have the numbers to give you, but it's, it's a very large percentage of the population. I think you're getting to spit from the corner. Still. So, this, this, this is, sorry. This is like, if you remember, I don't know whether you're as old as I am, but if you remember during Margaret Thatcher time, the corn was a problematic in this country because Margaret Thatcher decided it's very expensive to dig the coal out rather than we want to buy a South African coal, it's much cheaper. And but Polish at the time. Polish. It's a Polish and South African so together. <coughs> but didn't realize, you know, the long term effect of the side industry, the people's life, the cultural changes, and the uh, unemployment, etc. So the government, like Turkish government, is very often doing it now. Is they are investing in, for example, buying a tohum, seeds. Seeds. seeds from the other country rather than saving their own seeds themselves because the reason is it becomes cheaper in the short term. So I think this, this is the problem of capitalism unless I remember during this uh, latest crash, they start talking about in BBC4, oh, maybe Marx was right. Because the capitalism themselves, or capitalists themselves, if they don't understand the production is very important, not only, you know, just investing on the money and expecting this speculation, as you explained, to return some money, it will just collapse eventually. I think this is what's happening in the capitalist world because it's a, uh, easy money, it's very attractive, and manufacturing industry, if we think England here, is, is going down dramatically, and hence the side effects of it now within this society, let alone Greece or Turkey, it's obviously, you know, they are just discovering the capitalism, if you like. Well, there is no answer because if you're giving your own answer. It's basically like a, a trying to, to have uh, conversations between people, you know, the ones who should understand what they, who, who know what needs to be done and the ones who should do what needs to be done. And it's like talking, you know, an atheist to uh, somebody who is uh, a devout uh, believer. So there's never contact there. Yeah, I understand that Kukwe uh, is a sort of no front, no to everything. So they are trying to keep at least very uh, um, consistent. consistent in saying one thing. Mm -hmm. and, and Syriza ladies were fuming about Kukwe uh, attitude. But Okay, well, I understand. I don't accept it, but I, I understand that Kukwe wants Greece out of EU. What do they propose? What do they say to their people? Okay, we go out of e European Union with all uh, it is uh, obligations. So what? What do they? What is their uh, vision? What do they uh, promise to people? What's happening in England? Yeah. Well, <coughs> I, uh, I cannot answer for Kukwe uh, uh, because they have a mind of uh, that mindset that I, I can't fathom. But um, I have a very instructive uh, uh, link to give you, provided that well, it's in Greek, unfortunately, that is called Kukwe Generator. And Every time you click on it, it produces a document 
from the Kukue uh, uh, archives and so on. Mm. And it analyzes it. And it's basically, you can see how solid the analysis is, that it always has a start, it, this is the problem, that's what we must do, and this is where the working class needs to come into it. But it is lead, leaden words. You know, they're not, they don't really say, okay, we need to do something. It's as if somebody gives you an essay to write and say, oh, you've got to write it by tomorrow. So you write a few words and it's basically praising uh, Marxism, Leninism, and, and leaving everything out of the equation. Because it doesn't say, on this particular problem, we've got to do X, Y, and Z. We've got to organize like that. It's, it's talking in generalities rather than specifics. Okay. Uh, so excuse me for digging the problem again, but you have an oil industry, olive oil, olive industry, which is hegemonized by the Italian buyers. You have a tourism industry, which is organized under the booking.com, last minute.com or whatever. They are hegemonizing. You have agriculture, which lacks skilled labor or labor. After the crisis, usually wages go so much uh, to bottom that it becomes a sort of attraction for foreign capital to invest. There must be, I'm just trying to think logically, there must be some uh, German machine industrialist coming and building a factory outside Salonika to export it to Turkey or whatever, using all the European Union funds and so on. Don't, doesn't such sort of investment happen in Greece now? Not to any great extent that I know of, anyway. Remember, you asked the professor of turbulence, not of economics. <laughs> but not that I know of. But why would the uh, uh, why would a German investor if, let me give you an, an example that I know from my, my own field. India makes steel, Germany makes steel. The German steel is of high, such high specification that it sells like gold in comparison to the Indian steel. So this is the difference. Why should they invest in doing something in a, in a country like Greece, for example, that they're going to have all the structural problems and having to deal with things they, are not, they don't know very much about, uh, whereas they can produce the high-end product in their own country. Or they could link with a supply chain from Greece. So they could say, okay, let's buy, buy this bit from Greece. But there again, perhaps there is no trust, I don't know. Perhaps there isn't, the opportunity hasn't struck them so far. The Germans are using a lot of the neighboring Eastern European countries as part of their supply chain. A lot of them. Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, you name it. No, yes. And China. Yeah. 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 And China. Yeah, but I'm talking about China. even within the EU, they're using, they're using quite a lot of the surrounding states. And, uh, and they call it the shots there. But what I saw... The, the Chinese, what, don't they invest in? Turks were investing in... Have, Turks were investing in what I saw around Aten, around Turks, Turks were there. Yeah. With their factories, what, I, I, I can't remember what now. Kitchen product, that, that kind of, aluminium, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. They were there. there and I, I said, what, what's going on to my friends? And, and he said, since 2008, they moved a lot. They start investing there. The port of Piraeus is basically given to Chinese. 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 Yeah. I mean, there is there is foreign uh, investment, but the issue is what what under what conditions this investment is made, mm. and these are the, the major problems. I mean, there, there were lots of uh, fights with the with the workers in the, the ports, strikes and so mm. on, attempts to to get better conditions. They got something, but they didn't really win in the end of the day, as far as I'm aware. And the other guy says, that picture of the blue military.
Sorry? Dark page of the blue Mediterranean. Any other questions? Um, regarding what you said about the pharmaceutical companies and the price of the drugs, um, can it also lead, um, I mean, if the prices of the uh, uh, generic drugs produced in Greece go uh, very low, I think it may also have something to do with the fact that sometimes we had, we're running out of medication, maybe medication being exported to other countries? It could very well be. But this is a, quite a, a complex issue. And I remember talking to somebody who's uh, in the um, National uh, uh, Drug Association, mm. or the equivalent in, in Greece. And he was telling me the, uh, uh, of a particular example of negotiations that we're doing with three countries that ask you to remain nameless in order to play with the prices of the drugs. It was, I, I, I admit I couldn't follow it because it was quite a complex procedure. But what became apparent to me from that, uh, that discussion, that description that he gave me, is that um, keeping the, the drug prices low wasn't the main target. It was primarily, it was, the, the, it was pushed by external factors, whether there were agents because it's agents that deal with the generic drugs around Europe uh, and the big pharmaceuticals. So I cannot claim any expertise on the subject, but it, it seemed to me it was, uh, it was something that was doomed. I mean, that there would be, I'm not sure how much of it there is today, there would be no uh, uh, Greek pharmaceutical industry, generic drug industry left. And um, certainly you would, the benefits to the Greek patients would not be that great because uh, a lot of the big pharmaceuticals are pushing for their own products. You know, there's aspirin, but there is aspirin X, and aspirin X, you know, hits the headache in five seconds flat, that sort of thing. So, and with a lot of the um, uh, the new drugs that are developed, the patents last for what thirty years or so. Mm -hmm. So you can't do anything, and these are the drugs that are. They're, they're promoting. So having cheap generic drugs is okay for certain things, but when you're dealing with all these cancers and all these new cancer drugs, which you know very well, I presume, um, they're not going to be available in the market for many years. They're not going to be generic. One, one last question about the relations between the Greek economy and Cypriot economy. Uh, after the crisis, how did affect the Cyprus economy? Uh, well, there is... I'm not quite sure I know how big the relation of, this, of the Greek Cypriots and the Greek economy is. Because in the end of the day, the Cypriots have got uh, uh, a lot of foreign capital, a lot of Russian capital, uh, first and foremost. And uh, <coughs> yes, they have relations with, uh, uh, with Greece, they have trades with Greece, but I think Cypriots are first and many of the Cypriots, uh, Cypriot businessmen are first and foremost businessmen, and secondly Cypriots are Greek Cypriot businessmen. So they will, uh, as an example for, for, to, to, to give you, it's considered treacherous if you go from Greek Cyprus into Turkey Cyprus to take a flight out. But the flights are cheaper from the Turkey Cyprus. Cyprus. So they go there very quietly in order to take the cheap flights. So they are the same people who would be speak nationalistically when they're back in their own uh, half, but they will go there in order to use the cheap Same is true for the Turkey yeah. Cyprus. <laughs> <laughs> you don't go to Cypriot Cyprus because there are lots of European goods there, cheaper. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.